tonight. Superfish just got fishier. Your phone might be tracking you, even when it's turned off. And a new YouTube for the toddler set. Tech News Tonight is next. This is Twit. This is Tech News Tonight, episode 279 for Friday, February 20th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by lynda.com. Invest in yourself and start learning today. lynda.com has thousands of courses to help you learn new tech, business, and creative skills. For a free 10-day trial, visit lynda.com slash TN2. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2. I'm Megan Maroney. Let's get right to the top story of the day. Yesterday, we told you that computer maker Lenovo shipped Windows laptops bundled with a spammy visual search technology called Superfish. The software not only shows you unwanted ads, but also leaves your computer vulnerable to man-in-the-middle attacks. Customers complained and called the software malicious, and now Microsoft and even the U.S. Department of Homeland Security agree. In fact, the U.S. government's Computer Emergency Readiness Team, U.S. CERT, today said that Superfish called was a critical threat to security. Ian Thompson from The Register is back to talk about this story and others. Welcome, Ian. Hi, Megan. So I want to be clear from the outset, you are a longtime Lenovo user. You, you say you love your ThinkPad. You're not just some Mac evangelist laughing from the sidelines at all this. <laughs> oh, I have standards, please. No. <laughs> um, I've been a ThinkPad user for 15 years. I love them. The keyboards are great. The build quality is so good. You could beat, beat a PR representative to death with one and still use it afterwards. <laughs> have you? I... I Ah, tempting, Temp <laughs> very tempting, but no. But I mean, I always use ThinkPads the same for the last 15 years, but once this laptop dies and when I can't you know, renew it anymore, it's going out the window because this is just, it's the most egregious breach of customer, um, of customer, of customer rights, if you like, since the Sony rootkit debacle over a decade ago. And they sort of apologized, kind of, which is nice because people don't really apologize anymore. But I can't figure out what's worse, the malware itself or their initial response to it. Oh, well, I mean, it was painful. Their initial response was, we're putting it there to introduce customers to new things that they may be interested in, which is a nice way of saying we've spammed, we've, put, we've, we've sold you out to the adware makers. Um, they then said, oh, it's perfectly safe. And really, up until yesterday afternoon, they were saying it was perfectly safe. Um, this morning, I got a message from Superfish saying, yes, we're quite secure. You know, we're quite sure that our software is secure. And then 15 minutes later, US CERT comes out and says, actually, this is a critical flaw, which the rest of the security company com world has been saying for, year, you know, for, for the last day or so now. And you need to get it off your system. It's Lenovo's response has been utterly pathetic on this. So the software intercepts sites, even HTTPS websites, even sites with locks, all of that stuff, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Basically, it carries its own root certificate, which means if you try and visit, uh, set up a secure HTTP communication with, say, your bank or your personal email provider, um, it'll use that root certificate to set up a dummy site so that it can carry on scanning what you're doing. So, in, in, in essence, it's, it's basically subverting the, old, the whole HTTPS system just so that it can sell you advertising based on what you're doing. And that also means that if you're, if you're using it for other sites, then they, they, and a hacker is trying to do a man-in-the-middle attack on you, it's much, much easier to do it. Now, you could argue, I guess, maybe if a good adware would be would be something which would bring a benefit to the user, and I have severe arguments with that one. But this software is rubbish. I mean, it took two hours to crack the encryption on Superfish. And if, we, if, you know, if security people have done it in two hours, God knows what the hacking community could do with this. I mean, literally every laptop with this on is potentially rooted. Right. Well, someone in our chat room is saying that, um, pointing out that Superfish was never on uh, ThinkPads, which you know, of course, we should point mm -hmm. that out. It's on their lower, cheaper, low margin hardware, correct? But that's almost worse. I mean, they're saying, by, by putting it on the consumer laptops, they're saying, we know this is something that enterprise and power users wouldn't want on their system, but consumers are to hell with them. We'll throw them to the advertisers. That's almost more insulting than putting it across the entire range. So do you think that they really, I mean, they're sort of claiming their own stupidity here. They're saying, well, we had no idea <laughs> that, do you believe that? Um, 
It's always advisable in my experience to attribute these sort of things to stupidity rather than malicious intent. And I honestly think that's the way it is here. But the very fact they're saying it was our fault we didn't do proper due diligence and opening themselves up to some major lawsuits in doing so shows quite how badly they've mishandled this situation. And so do you think that they were trying to make money off the low margin laptops? Do you think that's why they well, were doing it? I mean, they say that their involvement, their financial involvement with Superfish was small. But I do say, I mean, it does cast into question. I mean, Lenovo has been um, seen in the industry as being quite unique in that it can make money on basic box shifting of PCs and laptops in a way that some other companies like HP and Dell don't seem to be able to. And you do start to wonder how much of this is down to its manufacturing processes being right on the ball and how much it is to it farming out its users for financial benefit. Right. So how long has this, has Superfish been in around or how long has it been in Lenovo laptops? Well, in Lenovo laptops, uh, the company said and confirmed also today it started at the program in September 2014 and it ran until January of this year, which means there will still be Lenovo laptops out there which have in the shops waiting to be bought, which have Superfish on them. Now, Superfish as a company has been around for years now and there are other pieces of software uh, which use, which use the same Superfish code signing certification, which does leave, leave, leave you um, on a very shaky ground from a security perspective, including one delightfully uh, delightful piece of parental control, control software called Keep Your Family Safe, when in fact it does anything but that and makes you much more susceptible. So that that's just a separate software that Superfish makes, or yes. that the company that, that made... The, the company, the, the, the Superfish code is in the code that is used by that product, as far as we can tell. Right. Um, and there are reports, although we haven't managed to get any proper confirmation on this, that as many as another hundred companies may be using Superfish's software in the same way. And you can, you can bet that security researchers this weekend are going to be burning the midnight oil to see if they can find any more samples out there. Right. So uh, Windows Defender, which is the antivirus software built into Windows 8, that they now claim to be able to clear your system of Superfish. Yeah. Basically, we got a word through from email from Microsoft today because we got in contact with them yesterday and said, look, surely this breaks your OEM terms and conditions. Um, they were very sort of Trappist, Trappist about it in terms of in terms of comment. But now they've said, yes, Windows Defender will remove this. And I gather from chatting to sources near, near to Microsoft, it will not only remove the Superfish software, but it will also remove this root certificate, which is causing all the security problems. So running Windows Defender will help you out. And there are also other websites out there, which you just have to visit the website and it'll tell you whether or not you've got Superfish running. All right. Great. Well, I guess we'll be following this story as it continues. Um, let's move on now. Uh, there, you also have a story about some Russian hackers that got into uh, the State Department's employee email, and that was a couple months ago, and they're still there. Uh, well, it's believed they're Russian. It's very difficult to directly attribute it, but um, sources have told a number of news outlets that yes, we, um, we everyone knew that in November the US State Department got hit by uh, hacking. It had to shut down its unclassified email server to try and clear out the infection. And this came as part of a wave of hacking attacks against a lot of US government sites, including the White House and the Post Office. Um, what is surprising is that now multiple sources are saying the State Department can't get rid of these uh, of these attackers. Every time they try and shut down one of the back doors that has been put in, another five or six pop up. And of course, the State Department has servers all around the world in the embassies that, that the US has in, in every country. So actually stamping this down is going to be very difficult because they can't shut down the entire network and do a thorough cleaning. What they're having to do is shut down section by section and where sections are still left open, then the attackers are, by all accounts, shifting over to there, setting up a new bunch of backdoors there, and it's a game of whack-a-mole that the State Department doesn't seem to be able to win. Now, do we know what the hackers are able to do or what they're able to see once they're in there? Um, well, okay, the, the reports are that it's still only the unclassified email system, so all the juicy stuff that the State Department has to keep, you know, ultra-secret squirrel, uh, that's kept in a separate email system which seems to be secure at the moment. But there's going to be a lot of crossover between users using the unsecured and the secured system, and the amount of data they'll be able to get from the emails in the unsecured system would presumably be able to help them set up attacks on people who have access to the secure system and try and get into that as well. And we've also seen reports 
announced that some uh, emails regarding U.S. policy on the Ukraine uh, have been stolen and have been, and have been listed among some of the booty, which leads to the Russian conclusion that they're involved. Right. So now they, they supposedly got into the system when a State Department employee clicked on a phishing link. I mean, is that all it really takes? <laughs> It's it's what we call the layer eight problem. Uh, you've got seven networking layers and then layer eight is the human being at the end of it. And that's usually the point of failure for any piece of security software. What appears to have happened is they clicked on a link, their browser wasn't properly patched, and once on a web, web page with an unpatched browser, that web page can then inject malicious code onto your system. And once they're actually on the system, could explore around it and move on to the next person using their address book and contacts lists. Um, it's, it's how these kind of things work. You really only need, need to find one point of failure, one person who's just a little bit too keen to click on that link and with software that isn't properly secured, and that's it, game over. You think that they would mandate security updates Ha, yeah, you would, wouldn't you? Um, but yes, it seems that government is, is as bad, if not worse, uh, as corporate America at this sort of thing. I mean, you can sympathize with IT managers because rolling out patches is an enormous pain in the fundament. But at the same time, if you're the US State Department, you really should be keeping this either very much, yeah, you know, keeping everything patched as soon as possible or using you know, a very cut down and cut down on limited system, which uses white lists and black lists to block out pages that can and can't be visited on. Quite frankly, it doesn't say an awful lot for the state of the State Department's security. No, no, it doesn't. So uh, another story you wrote about was a new kind of Android malware that spies on you even when your phone is turned off. How does that work? <laughs> Ah, uh, well, this is quite a cunning one, actually. Um, when you, if, if you've got the malware on your phone, when you go to turn the phone off, It'll intercept that uh, command, keep the, the the radio aerial going, and run through the automatic shutdown animation on your phone so it looks like it's going to sleep, and then kill the screen. So you put the phone down, plug it in, go to sleep maybe. Meanwhile, the phone is actually working. It can send text messages to expensive premium lines, call up foreign numbers, uh, again, with a premium attached. It can even record voice calls according to the code samples we've seen. It's a pretty nasty bit of kit. And while law enforcement has had the ability to turn phones on remotely for quite some time now, this is the first time we've really seen it in a, in a relatively widespread form in the, from the criminal malware community. Uh, and it has the potential to be really quite nasty because the only way to defend against it, if you actually have it on your system and you're not, and you're not running security software, is to take the battery out of your phone. And there's an increasingly small number of phones that you can do that with. Right. So should we panic? Um, don't panic, no. Um, run some basic, I mean, the signature files have now been shared amongst the security vendors. So if you're running security software on your phone, um, then you should be okay. Um, AVG has also set up a, a module so that you can check. If you're not running security software on your phone, you're an idiot and you really should be. Um, and as I say, if worse comes to the worst, just do the engineer's reset, take the battery out of your phone. But you should be scanning your smartphone for security problems on a fairly regular basis now. There's not a lot of excuse for not doing that. So what's your favorite Android uh, antivirus software? Uh, I'm looking at Cheetah at the moment, but I'm, I'm looking at a bunch of uh, a bunch of other solutions. It's it's only really in the last couple uh, last year to eighteen months um, that I've actually considered it necessary to do this sort of thing. I mean, at the moment, we don't have any nasty, particularly nasty bits of malware out there because they all, almost all, require you to download and download a a, a, you know, a piece of software, uh, and I basically don't download. App anything to my smartphone unless I know exactly where it's coming from and I have trust in the source. The problem is that there's an awful lot of third-party Android marketplaces out there and a lot of third-party apps which are small enough to go under the radar but with ha have very nasty payload payloads built in, as we've seen with other Android malware cases. Right. So do you think that it's actually being used now to trace, trace people or is it more theoretical? Oh, no, I mean, 10,000 infections already spotted. They're mainly in China. It looks like this was built around a Chinese local language Android market. Um, and, you know, it was stuffed into one of those apps and people have, have, have now started, it's now started to show up on the radar. So, I mean, in general terms, 10,000 isn't a lot of infections and it is highly localized. But everyone shares code in the malware industry and you can bet your bottom dollar that this is going to be showing up in future malware samples. Right. Well, there was another piece that we talked about today uh, in Wired.com on their threat level site about how researchers have determined that it's theoretically possible to track a person's location through an app just by examining the app's power consumption. Now, is it just time for us to give up and assume we're always going to be tracked? 
<laughs> well, only the paranoids survive. But, <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it, this is a really interesting theoretical paper. There's an awful lot that power management can tell you about a computing function. Uh, I was at a conference about the uh, 12 years ago where they'd actually they were using power management on CPU cycles to try and get passwords that way, and we're having a significant amount of success. With this system, as I understand it, it does a similar sort of thing, but with the GPS function. And so many applications at the moment have access or have need to access GPS, that this could potentially be a very interesting vector for tracking people down. Right, so you know, we can turn off tracking and our settings, but we can't really turn off the power consumption. Uh, no, what you can do is go into, um, in terms of power, cons power consumption, all that data is generally available to, 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 to developers because it's really handy for fine-tuning your app so it uses the minimum amount of power. Um, there's really not a lot you can do based on current set, you know, based on the, the theoretical examples they've, they've put forward. I would like to see this try, well, I, mean, I wouldn't particularly like to see it, but you understand what I'm saying. I would like to see this applied to a real-world setting right. uh, and maybe give a few examples of how it's done in practice because theoretically a lot of things are possible, but in practice there's usually a few code bumps which get in the way and stop it from being a, a, a practicable system for tracking people. Right. That said, you know, I mean, we're spending 50 billion a year with the NSA. I'm sure they're looking at this sort of thing. Exactly. So on a lighter note, YouTube announced that they'll be launching a new YouTube Kids app on Monday. Videos will be age-appropriate and there'll be no comments. Uh, there will also be time limits so that you don't have to pay attention to your children at all. Just hand them the iPad and then it's the, <laughs> it's the, the YouTube app's fault. Or not the iPad, I should say, because it's only an Android app right now. Um, I would like to believe they're doing this because parents ask for it. But what I really think is that kids are a great way to advertise too. What do you think? Uh, it, it comes down to kids are an enormously lucrative advert, uh, advertising market and Google wants to get in on that. I mean, there are some really positive things in this. Having you know the, the ability to set a parental timer um, is really very handy indeed. Uh, although I suspect with the state of computer knowledge amongst kids these days, most of them will be able to disable it with just a little bit of uh, a little bit of uh, uh, work on the side. But in, in general, it's it's a very good idea for Google because it gives them direct access to that most lucrative market, children. Um, I think it was the old Catholic Church that said, "Give me the child until seven, and I'll give you the man." And <laughs> advertisers work on the same principle. Uh, actually, given the Catholic Church's recent record, that's probably something they want to forget. <laughs> Um, advertisers know that if they can get the children locked in early, they have a customer for life. And they're also aware that kids have pester power that can make their parents' lives an absolute misery if they decide that they want something or they must watch something or they must listen to something. As any parent who's been exposed to Frozen knows, and we need to help them do more to help these parents escape <laughs> that terrible curse. That is true. Uh, do you think they'll be able to moderate this in any effective way? Um, in terms of moderating uh, sort of how people use it, I think it for the younger for the younger audience certainly, um, but the older audience. I mean, kids are, are scarily tech savvy these days. You know this yourself, and they're quite able of now and able to navigate around these uh, the sort of parental controls that are set up there just by visiting another website. But as I say, I mean, it's a useful step for Google in terms of getting the advertisers. And there is some stuff in there to give parents a little bit of reassurance. But let's face it, you know, when it comes to dealing with kids on the internet, you really have very few things you can do other than just have one family PC in the living room that can only be used when there's someone else there. And I don't really think that works anymore. No, that honest. is completely that impractical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting because I do think this will be a complete relief to lots of parents because I hear this all the time. You know, I want to show my kids this video and then along the side are all of these horrible videos. And it's not just that, it's the comments. The comments are really often the problem on oh. so many websites. I mean, you see these, here's how to make a bracelet out of rubber bands. Then there's just 12 comments comments that are just completely horrible and Oh, awful, obscene so. in many cases as well. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's just the state of the comment the state of the state of commentary on YouTube is is possibly one of the worst in the actual in the in the industry. Um, I did love uh, Randall Monroe's idea of having a little app that you put into your browser. Every time you posted a comment on YouTube, it read it back to you. And when you actually heard it out loud, you'd be sitting there going, oh, my God, I'm an idiot. What was I thinking? You know, <laughs> That is a fantastic idea. Yeah, I think that people will be relieved, but I hope they'll also keep in mind, you know, that nothing is really safe. And, I mean, frankly, I'm more worried mm. about Instagram than I am about YouTube. So 
but that's a oh, completely indeed. other story. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I mean, it's just a factor of sitting down with kids and just explaining to them about the internet world and what's there and what isn't there. And if they're upset by something, they should come and see you. And if they're not upset by some things they see, they really should be. And um, just, edu I mean, we're having to educate the next, this, this is the first generation which is growing up with internet, with broadband internet as a given. And it creates a whole new range of parenting challenges that we've never seen before. And I think every parent is just feeding their way through the morass, hoping they don't muck up too badly. Right. And that was probably the state of parenting forever. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, yes, thank indeed. you. Thank you so much, Ian. You, we covered a lot today. I really appreciate it. What, what are your big stories that you're working on next? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, the Lenovo one is going to go on and on for a week or so, I, I, I think. The latest Snowden dump on SIM cards, um, hacking by the NSA and GCHQ, that's probably one of the biggest Snowden links we've, leaks we've seen at the moment, and this week has been taking up a lot of time. As for next week, who knows what the news gods will bring us. Well, maybe you should spend some time on the YouTube for Kids uh, app. Just, just to, to chill relax, out. But yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Megan. Have a good weekend. You too. That's Ian Thompson from The Register. You can follow Ian at, at Ian Thompson on Twitter. Coming up, Apple wants you to test the next iOS, and Trivia Crack doesn't want to see your dumb questions. But first, this episode of Tech News Tonight is brought to you by lynda.com. You would not be watching or listening to this right now if you didn't have an insatiable desire to learn more stuff. Invest in yourself and learn something new with a free 10-day trial to lynda.com. The internet is full of free online tutorials, but most of them are not so good. And who has the time to sort through and watch all of them to find out the ones that are good? This is why millions of people around the world use lynda.com. lynda.com has over 4,500 courses on topics like web development, photography, visual design, and business, as well as software training like Excel, WordPress, and Photoshop. Are you looking to get started with photography or improve the photos you take? I recommend courses like Photoshop CC Essential Training, Burt Monroe's Pixel Playground series, and lynda.com's Photography 101 and Foundation of Photography series. Whether you have 15 minutes or 15 hours, each course is structured so you can learn at your own pace and on your own schedule from start to finish. All lynda.com courses are taught by experts who are accomplished professionals at the top of their fields. Do something good for yourself and sign up for a free 10-day trial to lynda.com by visiting lynda.com slash TN2. You'll get unlimited access to every course, including access on your iOS and your Android devices, plus new courses as they're added each week. That's L-Y-N-D-A dot com slash TN2 to try it free for 10 days. Go ahead and learn something new. Now on to a few more stories we're following today. 9to5Mac is reporting that Apple will offer its first ever public betas for the newest operating system for iPhones and iPads. Non-developers will be able to test iOS 8.3 in March and iOS 9 this summer. They're calling it a public beta, but it appears to be only open to those participating in Apple Seed, an invitation-only program that allows people to test pre-release software products. Do you like to watch other people play video games? Do you like conventions? Get ready for TwitchCon. Video game streaming company Twitch announced today they'll be holding their first ever convention in San Francisco on September 25th and 26th of this year. Now, Twitch allows viewers to watch skilled video game players on a live stream. The company was acquired by Amazon last year for $970 million and currently has 100 million viewers a month. We'll put the link to sign up for the convention in our show notes. Move over, Microsoft. It's Google's turn for some antitrust action. In Russia, Reuters reports that the Russian antitrust regulator opened a case against Google on behalf of Russian search company Yandex. Yandex says that Google violated an anti-monopoly law by requiring manufacturers running Android devices to include Google's services. And finally, the Wall Street Journal reports that the free app Trivia Crack might be a victim of its own success. In case you're not one of the 130 million people who've downloaded Trivia Crack, I'll tell you that it's a highly addictive trivia game that lets you compete against friends and frenemies around the world. It's like Trivial Pursuit, but you don't have to sit around in a living room interacting with your family while you play it. The game is more popular than Candy Crush Saga, more popular than Angry Birds or Flappy Birds or any bird or candy-related game. It might even be more popular than birds or candy. It's really popular. But the wild success of the game could be the root of its demise. 
The game relies on users submitting questions that need to be reviewed, and each question needs the approval of at least 100 players before the question is included in the game. The Wall Street Journal says the sheer number of players submitting questions is causing a backlog. Also, people tend to submit the same question, and they're not always good questions. Here's an idea for a trivia question. How do you make sure you have a scalable business model before you release your app? That's it for this edition of Tech News Tonight. Subscribe to the show at twit.tv slash TN2. Write to us at TN2 at twit.tv and watch live every weekday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And don't miss our morning news program, Tech News Today, every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. I'm Megan Maroney. Thanks for watching. Bandwidth for Tech News Tonight is brought to you by Cashfly.com.